Hello, everyone. You're tuned into the Reuters Events webinar, The Agile Marketing Team, Adapting Your Strategy During a Global Crisis. My name is Jasmine Keyes, and today I am joined by a panel of expert leaders to understand how businesses are managing their marketing teams through this unprecedented crisis. Firstly, I'd like to introduce a good friend of Reuters events, Nicholas Zeisler. Nick is an all-round marketing and customer experience expert. Over the past few years, he has been bopping between independent consulting, the US Air Force, and HP, most recently as the Director of Customer Experience. How are you, Nick? Doing well, Jazz. Good day to you. Yeah, really excited to get into this. Um, I did have a question for you. Oh, yeah? Before, before we introduce the speakers, how do you think brands have, have been adapting their messaging to suit new customer needs, wants, and expectations? Uh, are there any brands that are kind of standing out to you? Yeah, yeah. Without without naming the not so guilty, I would say that there are actually even broad swaths of different industries that are that seem to be doing well. I know, for example, if you've been following uh, on on LinkedIn, I've been keeping track of uh, air, airlines and accommodation companies that are doing things like showing loyalty to their customers in this time when nobody can go out and travel. I mean, this is a really tricky time for those companies. And yet they've, they're finding uh, creative ways to show appreciation for their customers. For example, extending loyalty status for another year into the new year when they know nobody can travel. It's really tricky because that's a tough relationship to keep going when they're making no money and nobody's flying and nobody's staying in accommodations that there are going to be some awkward conversations about, you know, losses of uh, deposits and so forth. This is a pretty straightforward, simple way that they can show to their to their most loyal customers that they have loyalty going the other way as well. Pretty creative, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's been some brands that have done quite good adaptations. I'm thinking. Um, you know, Budweiser released their famous Was Up ad in, in 1999, yeah. but it recently resurfaced as a plea for friends to check on their friends in quarantine. So I think this was a really great example of understanding new customer concerns because social distancing is a challenge for us all, especially those with mental health issues. And um, and, and Budweiser have provided a, a valuable message in this lighthearted and almost nostalgic adaptation. Yeah, it was, it was definitely relatable and, and watching it myself, I was ta certainly taken back to, to that time. Obviously, you had to go into the archives and dig it up what us old folks used to listen to, but uh, <laughs> it, it certainly took me back. <laughs> Well, well, that's now. That's what we're looking at at the moment. But yeah. what about after COVID-19? I'd, I'd like to pose this question to our audience while I introduce our speakers. So we'll bring up that poll now. Um, you should see on your screen which industries are going to flourish after COVID-19. Um, we've got co-working space, rideshare, online collaboration software, food delivery services, and e-commerce platforms. Um, so I'll, I'll let you, uh, our audience, take a look at that um, for a moment. And I'd like to introduce our wonderful speakers. So first we have Jackson Janayaga, Vice President, General Manager, DTC at Clorox. Maytel Rasmussen, Head of Global Marketing, Roche Diagnostics Information Solutions. And Saranya Babu, Senior Vice President, Marketing at Reich. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I'd love to look at those poll results now and, and get your thoughts on, on the results. What do you think, Nick? Certainly not a surprise uh, with all of the uh, everything moving to online and not being able to shuffle papers between each other at work anymore and not even being able to meet in person anymore. I'm not surprised at all uh, by this. Yeah, I mean, uh, the online collaboration software was definitely going to be yeah. up there, but almost 60 percent. That's that's really interesting. Um, right. You know, here, Mm, sorry, go on. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, that uh, those e-commerce platforms, that makes a lot of sense, too, because with so much of uh, 
interactions with vendors and retailers anymore going to online. They're looking for different solutions. And I was on a call just the other day on a, on a founders group where in third world nations where people are trying to develop these new ways of doing interacting with commerce and so forth, that they're having to rely on these things. I'm not too surprised about that. Absolutely. And I think it's going to take quite some time for for everyone to fully, you know, reimmerse themselves into into the outside world. Um, it, you know, it is quite a, a scary time. Um, so I think that those should boom um, like like we've predicted here. And, and what about our, our panelists, Jackson, Maytal, Saranya? Any thoughts on on this these results? I think this I think hi, this is Sonia here. All right, go ahead, Meta. Uh, this is Meta. I think that the online software collaboration, it's it's uh, collaboration software, is great. It's uh, it has implications on multiple industries. I think that it's uh, it's going to be um, a huge uh, jump in innovation in 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 software so we start using tools that were not even ready in the market right to go to market and uh, and this is the time that the poc on a global scale is going on so it's really exciting to see what's going to come up out of that hi this is saranya so just to add on to what Mitchell said completely agree with what you said um, I feel that there is a kind of a forced shift uh, in the market that we're seeing coming from that industry myself. Um, we're seeing where it's kind of moving from a nice to have interesting, you know, type of thing into a need, uh, an, an immediate need. So definitely, I think it's not surprising for me. So, Rania, I'm sure that we'll soon get to more discussions about those uh, online collaboration tools as we talk more about the work that uh, that Reich does, for sure. Looking forward. Yeah. All right. Well, Jazz, if you're ready, let's go ahead and jump into uh, to some questions here and and continuing on. Uh, we'll start with with Jackson. Um, you know, Jackson, we've definitely got just everything kind of up in the air right now and everything's been upended lately. Uh, you have some experience, not necessarily with, with Clorox, but uh, you and I were discussing the other day, you have some experience from in, in managing crises from a marketing standpoint. What, what from that experience do you find as important right now? Yeah, so, um, you know, unfortunately, I lived through two crises uh, before this, um, both company specific, one with T-Mobile, uh, for those on, on the webinar who can remember the T-Mobile sidekicks, uh, there was a moment in time when Paris Hilton was our face of the brand, and I was on the agency side, and uh, her sidekick uh, got hacked, and um, it was like 10, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, so pre-iPhone, pre-real smartphone adoption, a sidekick was the preeminent smartphone, essentially. So no one knew your photos could get shared um, and posted online. And she had uh, photos of herself as well as numbers of a lot of celebrities like Sean Combs and John Elway that all got leaked online over the weekend. Um, so this is also the emergence of social media, the emergence of tech blogs, the internet, and people not really knowing devices could be hacked. Um, so it was such a fascinating time and managing through that and, and all the people coming into customer care and coming into the stores on the weekend um, to asked to get their phones canceled or to, to, to express concern about their family's safety uh, was one. And then the bigger one was Chipotle, who has had a digital through the food crisis. I joined a few months before that and lived uh, about a year through it. Um, ultimately, all great experiences, but you know, I, I definitely don't wish that upon uh, my worst enemy. So you know, to answer your question, I, I do think, uh, Nick, that there's a lot uh, of opportunity for all of us to take learnings from there. Now, if you're in certain industries right now um, or in a future crisis, God forbid, you might be impacted more than others, but the one thing I would say has been consistent, and I'm, I'll say I've seen this at Clorox too in a very positive way, is you know leadership. Leadership is critical. It's got to come from the top. There's got to be consistent and transparent feedback and communication and over communication at all points, uh, even when things are unknown. So one of the things we learned at Chipotle was we probably didn't communicate enough internally and externally. So to me, that's first and foremost. You can have a playbook. You should have a playbook of here are all the potential scenarios for our business that are likely to happen. And there's things like current state where you couldn't predict 
predict, but when a scenario hits, when a crisis hits, it impacts your manufacturing, impacts sales, impacts customers at a broad level. There should be some playbook that says, hey, get these people together, inform them, and then level up to these people, right? And there's just a communication flow. Then when the thing happens, you can't predict all the variables to it, right? It could be exactly as you thought it would, like a recall potentially, or it could be something like this. Then you adapt that playbook, but at least you have all the pieces in place so you're not scrambling to figure out who to go call and who to talk to. And then you adapt that playbook um, as quickly as you can with a small group of key decision makers and you up level. So to me, that was a, the second lesson is we didn't have a playbook in, in some of those instances I referenced. And, and it would have been nice, even though we would have had to adapt it significantly, especially with the Chipotle one, because there's a lot of layers to that one. Um, and I would say the third piece is focus um, and prioritize. You know, sometimes it can be easy to chase things. It can be easy to panic and try to, to tackle the moon. And sometimes you just have to tackle it one day at a time. And, and you might have to kill other priorities and kill things that you might love or you might have heavily invested in. Um, but I can't say it enough how important it is just to focus and get your team focused, get all your great talent focused on the thing that's in front of you. Now, there might be other people in the business that don't need to really be involved and they can still keep going about their day-to-day -day business. But the communication is also important because depending on the scale of the crisis, people in your, in your company, um, and if you have uh, uh, if you have people um, in a retail environment, for instance, they're not as connected to corporate. So they're going to be hearing things from their friends and from media before they're hearing it from you sometimes if you're not really, really clear and crisp on over communication. So I would say that's another one is oh, constant over communication to your staff and what you're doing and what you're not doing and what you know and what you don't know. Sometimes companies, I think, get caught up and, and they kind of have to write a fine line because of um, investor stakeholders and obviously being a publicly traded company. But there are times you just have to say, especially in a crisis, here's what we don't know, but here's what we're working on. And I think sometimes companies want to just be able to say, here are all the things we're doing and here's what we know. And sometimes that unknown, which can be feel like the big gorilla in the room actually creates much more of like an albatross around your neck where over the next 30 to 45 days or less, it becomes the one question everyone wants to know and you that's the one you can't answer. So getting ahead of that, I found to be really important. I'd say the last piece is, you know, being nimble um, and, and really just being flexible, knowing that everything I just said could go out the window depending on what happened. So um, I, I just can't stress, stress out enough. You know, I assume every company and, and, and the leadership is going to do the right thing. Right. So that's the foundation there. Like no matter what, we're going to do the right thing ahead of sales, ahead of profit. But after that, all those pieces, those variables could change, right? Who's in the decision-making process, how much you communicate to who, you know, again, depending on the severity of it, um, it, it could change. But I found that those were some of the principles that in some cases we did better than others, but uh, I think hold true no matter what um, the scenario is. Great, Jax, thanks. Good, a lot of, lot of good inputs there. Saranya, do you have anything to add to that as well when it comes to managing, not necessarily just crises, but just being in this sort of dynamic world we are? and everything is different all of a sudden. Absolutely. So Jackson, a lot of uh, useful and very insightful stuff there. Agree with um, everything you said. Uh, so what we did uh, this time around was, uh, and we did a bunch of things, I would say very successfully, was um, to instantly, we, we realized that we needed to change, right, on a dime. So that's what we did. We said, we, you, you need to kind of get into the mindset that we need to change, right? What you, the plans you had, the annual plans, all of that kind of put that aside as much as they're beautiful and as much as you've invested time in them and it's hard to kind of, you know, put them aside uh, right in the heels of getting them done. We put them aside, you know, got into a, we need to change, but also we need to be always and constantly ready, right? Uh, to change, keep changing because the, uh, the the situation is changing us fast, much faster, and in an unpredictable way. So we need to always be uh, ready to change. So I think that process, really, when we implemented that, and when I look back on it, uh, pretty much if I had to put a, a structure to it and a name to it, that is what we call agile, right? Today in the industry, so it, we we implemented that playbook without really intending to implement agile or anything. Anyway, so that was one part. The second part, communication, to Jackson's point, uh, we had top-down communication. So we created a new set of OKRs for the whole company. Uh, we even created a, a new mission statement for the rest of the year. Um, so, so our mission statement is um, uh, do your best work, um, it, help you do the best work, uh, do the best work of your life, and we added, uh, you know, whether in office or remote, right? So to kind of uh, indicate that this is a big change and we need to have a, uh, a strategy towards that, even if it's temporary, right, until we get through it. So, so we did that, so top-down communication across the company, 
um, so that kind of aligned all of the teams, right? Because it is uh, it is a lot of change management, especially if you're in a bigger company, uh, a lot of change management and communicating that down to everybody so that we're all going the same direction. And then um, to add to that, we also kind of, uh, we also basically um, focused a shift of the strategy as well, right? A focus on, and this depends on your specific business uh, and how that's playing out in the situation. But for us, the focus was building loyalty, right? Versus uh, versus revenue. Um, we we didn't deprioritize revenue, but we thought this was a time to build, build loyalty. So those would be um, kind of the summary three kind of big pillars of our strategy. Great, Saranya. Thanks. That's good. I, I'm seeing, uh, you know, hitting on similar subjects here. And certainly that concept of agility is kind of what we're talking about today anyway. Maytal, I wonder that kind of leads into another good question here. Uh, when we're talking about agility and how things are changing, what would, would you say from a marketing perspective are the broad strokes about those shifts and the change that, changes that you're seeing, uh, specifically with respect to where we are right now? And then maybe we could develop that a little bit further into what we think might endure after this. But uh, just for now, what do you think those big changes are? Yes, um, thanks, Nick. And really alluding to what uh, Jackson, Jackson and Saranya uh, mentioned before, you know, agility is the new ways of working. Um, the scale and the severity of the of the pandemic of COVID-19 is really not yet uh, unfolded uh, fully and it's not very clear. So what we need to do in order to uh, to manage marketing and businesses is uh, is adapting and is you know just start thinking differently so all of this uh, creating like i want to say almost a new order you know with all the kpis and the okrs and all those things that were valid before they're not valid so we need to have um we need to embrace an organizational agility it's not it's not just uh uh, one thing or the marketing it's part of the whole ecosystem of the business of the company this is um this is a really unprecedented time and it's not time for self-promotion or upselling so we see brands uh reprioritizing their initiatives their um their campaigns uh like what jackson said you know you some priorities are being killed you know it's just not relevant anymore the second thing it's you need to adopt new strategies, new communications in during this kind of times uh, and shift rapidly. So um, you need to be relevant. You need to you need to be relevant for your consumers, for your target audience. You can't start. Uh, you can cont continue to do what you did before. Uh, you need to really understand the evolving needs of your customers and actually the world. It's it's the globe. It's not only. Uh, your customers now. So we see brands connecting to their higher purpose. You know, brand with purpose is very important right now because it's um, it, it 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 allows the brands to build trust. Um, every bench brand should ask the every brand and every marketing person should ask themselves. You know, how do we meet this the customers in in this unprecedented time? What can we do in order to be relevant, to continue build trust and loyalty, and and uh, and still bring value, even though it's not selling, it's it's a different kind of value. So um, I think that um, we we seeing now, although you know it's pretty fast for big brands to to start connecting and shifting, you know, to the higher purpose messaging. You know, if, whether it's environmental, I see brands using the picture of uh, the Himalayans mountain, you know, for the air quality or uh, patient focused and healthcare focused. Um, and um, in terms of messaging, the other thing that uh, when you connect to your purpose of, of the brand and connecting to the higher uh, spiritual purpose of the audience, we see messages that are more constructive, positive, just to keep resilience of the brand. 
Great, Mato. Excellent points. Uh, before we move on, Jax, let me just come kind of come back to you. We we began this part with with a question to you, and you had mentioned uh, agility and being able to adapt and so forth. What are your thoughts on this before before we move on to the next question here? On agility in general? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, listen, like, I, I, I think agility is a word that gets tossed around a lot, and a lot of companies think they're agile, and they're really not. Uh, so to me, agility is really simple, right? So forget the, the, you know, the true definition of how it was built and how this idea of agility for project management and software development was created, that the principles are really what matters, right? This ability to really prioritize people over processes to create some kind of output in a physical product or some product versus just process docs. And I think those to me are, are critical pieces in addition to obviously being nimble and flexible, which is obviously inherent in the definition of agility. So uh, for me, I have always loved it because you know if done right, however you define it for your company, right? Every company is different. Every company has different needs and sizes and so forth. So you have to adapt accordingly. But to me, the idea is that you empower your people. You have a clear vision. I always actually compare it to Curb Your Enthusiasm. What I heard about Curb Your Enthusiasm, for those of you who don't watch the show with Larry David, uh, the Seinfeld creator, is apparently he has a, a rough script. He has a, he has a beginning and ending and a, and a kind of rough plot line. And then he casts specific actors who can flow with it. So the idea is like, hey, here's the story, here's the beginning, here's the end, let's figure it out together. And then they ad lib throughout. So if you watch that show, there's a lot of ad libbing. And I think he also specifically picks actors that can ad lib with him and that are comfortable in that. So there is no like, if you've got to say this word, you got to say it with this emotion, it's like, hey, let's just go with it. We know the storyline, let's just take it wherever it goes. And I think it's beautiful. And I think that to me is a perfect definition of how agility should be in any kind of environment uh, when we're talking about this idea. So to me, it's this minimal viable product that we've talked about, the idea that we have a rough idea. We know where we want to be. We kind of have a rough idea of timeline, but even that is up in the air, but we just know what, where we need to be. So who is going to help us get there and how do we enable them to do that? And I think it's a combination of empowerment, autonomy, but with ongoing check-ins and, and kind of making sure that there's kind of iterations and some kind of, you know, you want to call it release dates or constant like updates and like, hey, here's what we push or here's what we created still in, in an MVP state, not maybe final. And we're constantly iterating on based on real time feedback, based on real results. Uh, and then we're changing it, but we're not getting beholden to a process or to a script or to something that's been written at a certain time that's no longer relevant. So to me, I love that. I think it's a perfect balance of clear vision, clear goal, but empowerment um, and, uh, and prioritizing the people and allowing them to do what they think is best and make decisions within that moment and within that framework that they think is best. And then, you know what, if things are gonna go off the rails, they're going to, no matter what. It doesn't matter how bundled up you are in the beginning or not, things will go off the rail and just be prepared for that. Adapt to it, optimize, and try your best not to make the same mistake twice. So for me, that applies in crisis, that applies to launching a product, that applies to really anything, uh, but even more so in a crisis um, situation. Awesome, Jack. Great points. And we are definitely uh, starting to get to kind of skirt around a point here that uh, that the call really is is all about. And by the way, um, just to speaking of Agile, uh, just a reminder that everybody attending here, you're, you're welcome to put questions into the, the comments box there. Uh, and we'll be addressing those as best we can as we go through this. But um, I, I just wanted to to jump right on this, and and Saranya, when we talk about agile, uh, there's you know as, as you and I were discussing the other day, there's there's lowercase a agile, which is just the concept of being agile and being dynamic, as we've been kind of talking all along. And then I think it's it's great that each of the three of you have already started to kind of allude to what I call capital A Agile, which is that uh, that project management approach. And of course, that came from the world of software development. And uh, as you and I were doing the other day, we're nerd out on the phone talking about it. But I think a lot of folks <laughs> may or may not necessarily from a marketing perspective, or folks that aren't in software development might not be as familiar with what Agile project project management is as opposed to the traditional waterfall method. Uh -huh. And clearly Jax and Maytal and you, Saranya, are familiar with it. You've been alluding to it. So let's just kind of talk about that a little bit. And if you could share your thoughts on how you think that approach is applicable to the marketing world, maybe even with a little bit of a of an introduction to kind of what it means and how it's done for those who might not be familiar with it yet. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so it all started. Uh, so back when, you know, a few years ago, it was all waterfall, right? So I started as a software engineer and everything was waterfall at that time because the world was kind of moving at at a slower pace, right? So we we had the time to do everything sequentially. So there's planning, and then there's designing, and then there's building, 
testing and launching, right? Um, so it was a very sequential process and sometimes launches were like six month to 18 month cycles. And the market was also moving at that pace because then everybody had the same kind of cycles. Now then what happened was, um, you know, a few things happened that forced um, companies to change their, um, change their, uh, the way they build, build products, right? And, and the shift to agile happened. A lot of things enabled that, one of them being just a technology, right? Advancement in technology. Previously in software, you couldn't actually launch bits and pieces, right? You could, you could do some bug fixes, but you couldn't really launch new stuff in bits and pieces. It had to be done as a whole because the, the process was like that. Uh, then the technology changed, the cloud came about. So you don't have to really, you know, it doesn't have, you don't have to really install anything, right? Um, and with, with improvements in like the CI, CD, what I call continuous you know, delivery, um, technology made it possible to launch features, um, you know, very quick, you know, smaller uh, features very quickly, right? So what that, what, what um, happened with that is then software companies were launching in you know, a product very quickly, right? Every two weeks, there's a, there are new features that, that were released. Now, what, what, that led to was the, the market became super competitive, right? The, the entire market. So all of your competitors, all of the software, um, the rate at which new features showed up in the market became a weekly type of thing uh, or a monthly type of thing versus, uh, you know, a quarterly or a annual type of thing. So then, you know, because of that, then in the market, everybody was kind of forced into this pace, which uh, many of many people are not ready for. Uh, marketing, for example, right? Um, traditionally, waterfall, uh, now that the market is moving this fast, you really can't move, you, know, you have to move at that pace, right? So we were kind of forced, everybody was, I think, on the business side also forced to kind of adapt to that pace. I think that's the beginning of Agile for the business side. So um, kind of what, what does Agile mean for the business side? Um, really, there are some, some key pillars there, right? The basic hypothesis or, or the thesis, that's the central thesis is that Given that the market or the sit, uh, or the um, kind of your ecosystem or the external factors are changing at a certain pace, you, you it doesn't make sense to have a plan that is longer than that pace, right? That is that outlives that pace. Which means if you do have a cadence that's longer, then what you release uh, at that time, what you launch at that time, would be irrelevant because the market would have already changed. So the rate of change uh, of the you have to move faster than the market to be relevant, right? So that's the kind of the central hypothesis. So then how do you do that? Um, so that's the, that's the only way to kind of stay relevant, right? So then you had to really uh, change things up and uh, go into what, what, what is agile, just as a kind of a survival thing, right? It's not, it's not a nice process, you, you've got to be agile. Um, so then if you look at the pillars of it, you start with an idea, as Jackson said, it's a start an idea or a strategy. You know, you know what the vision is, you know what the idea is. Uh, you don't have a plan or a process because unlike waterfall with agile the plan or the process is also a deliverable that you build over time right as you kind of build this and go along the way you have a process and, and, and a plan at the end of it and if this is something that's repeatable then you can kind of take that process optimize it make it a blueprint and repeat that right but building that process happens um kind of um while you do it so the second thing is, um, the second kind of important piece is that when you do it this way, um, so you build a small piece, you launch it, and then you see what the real results are, right, in, in the real market. And then based on that, you then come back and use those learnings to build something that's closer, right, to the right thing. And then you launch that, and then you see you get the learnings. And as you do this, you're kind of moving in lockstep with the market. So at the end of it, um, what you launch, let's say in a, in a, what you have in a six month period would be, um, or along the way, it's kind of towing, you know, uh, moving with the market versus, you know, starting something at a point in time and using the circumstances then to build a plan. And then when, by the time you launch it, you're way off, right? Market has already changed. So I would say those are the kind of the basic principles of that. And in the marketing side, we have, with uh, COVID especially, we were kind of forced to kind of move into that, that um, that particular paradigm and, and um, sometimes you know, I, I do have all the processes and everything, but I want to kind of leave you with that in terms of the, the high level principles.
Yeah, so Rania, it sounds like as you're describing it here, it's rather than being able to look way out in, a, in the distance and saying in 18 months or however far along, this is what we want, whatever this thing that we're building is, and that could be a, a marketing campaign or some sort of branding product. Rather than that, it's okay, well, we need something that, that makes sense right now because things in 18 months might look different. And it sounds like what you're saying here is that that's exactly where we are right now, given everything that's going on. So it's almost as though a time like this in, in such turmoil is really lends itself to that, uh, that approach that what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, previously it was more of a staying in touch with the market, you know, moving in lobster because the market already was imposing a certain uh, cadence of, you know, uh, changes upon us, right. Which was weekly or maybe like uh, in a few, few months, but now with COVID that cadence has shrunk to a point where, we have no choice but to be agile, right? Because there is no longer term because we don't know what the long term looks like. Now it's more of weeks. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maytel, would, would you agree with that? And are you seeing those that sort of thing happening now? And do you have experience uh, previously with that sort of thing? Yes, uh, absolutely. That, um, you know, this agility, you know, it requires different way of thinking. It requires, uh, you know, working in parallel and not really waiting for the waterfall to happen. It, uh, you know, it's actually kind of a combination of what Jackson said and, and what, what uh, Serrania was alluding to, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, what does it mean, new ways of working? You know, the interesting thing that that's happening from that, uh, you know, it's keeping the flexibility and uh, and empowering our employees to come with different things different initiatives and and uh, and and have different brainstorming actually on on what we need to do and it just doesn't happen uh, like before you know we live in a very uh, we're very fortunate in a way that we're living in such a great technology era you know we have so many tools to uh, to, to to utilize right now. As I said, there is lots of innovation that's going on right now with the, with technology and software. And companies, uh, the companies that that answer those needs for agility to 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 provide uh, um, uh, answers to the unmet needs of 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 companies right now uh, to to communicate and to to come up with new things and reshift the priorities they're they're flourishing right we saw that uh before with the with the poll um you know and yeah. i am asking my employees to to actually use and bring new new software to show how we can be agile and work in different and parallel uh and and keep the focus on our goals yeah, great, great point, Maytel. And in fact, that brings up brings me to to a topic I wanted to discuss next. And I want to get Jackson's input on this, but I first want to hear your thoughts on this. We're talking about this new approach and this agility, and and you were talking about um, about products and about software and platforms and so forth. And I know, Saranya, that that Reich has has a great platform for this as well. Uh, but I'm wondering now if you could share Maytel, and then and I want to go right to Jackson too. How is how is this uh, impacting like the teams? And you, you mentioned it just a little bit. Let's get back now to how we're interacting with the teams with all this stuff going on. And clearly there's the introduction of new approaches and new ways of doing things, but then there's all the persons and people and, and actual humans that you're interacting with and impacting on your on your teams. Would yeah. you talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, let's talk about it for a second. You know, what's the most important thing to this to keep the resilience of employees and leadership and communications are probably, you know, even have more impact right now because of the, the spread. So how do we keep resilience, you know, of, of, of work and, and keep going and uh, staying focused? You know, this pandemic really changed the way that the personal and professional lives, that the way we, we used to do uh, work or we used to communicate. And, uh, and it, it really is across the globe. It's not just in one company in one place. It's a shared, uh, a shared experience uh, throughout. And, um, you know, the, the balance has shifted, right? We need to navigate our personal life with our work life. And, and uh, sometimes it blends, you know, it's, it's not like a, 
it's not a clear cut. So as a leader, you know, as leaders, we need to be flexible. We need to empower the, the employees to, and the teams to know that it's okay. We need to accept it, that it's okay. And not uh, expecting the same, uh, the same output or the same um, KPIs to be met. So if you, if you as a leader, flexible and 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 want to keep the focus you need to let your people be a little bit more flexible and enable them in ways in different ways to do their work and uh you know sometimes if it's shifting of time sometimes it's understanding that this is now time for being with the kids you know you need you need to make lunch for the kids and i see that with my team so we keeping flexibility and that's part of the agility that we were talking before you know on 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 the marketing goals level and actually as a business level we definitely changing the way we uh we are being measured right if you think about marketing how can your kpis be the same kpis as before so that also is the pressure and and uh and help keep the resilience of your team members because they're not going to meet the same goals that that they put for themselves earlier. Um, as I mentioned, we're lucky enough to 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 live in a in such a great time of technology and innovation. So so many tools that are, are there, you know. But they, I'll just give you some things that we employ uh, in my team. We have. Uh, virtual cafes in the morning to just chat and then it's not work related we're using uh, a communication online chats for non-work and then sharing jokes so uh jokes and and whatever memes that are out there uh we have happy hours every once in a while and we even schedule lunch like a completely not work related lunch so you know there's a lot of things you could do for your team and to keep resilience and focus because if you as a leader give them this flexibility, enable them, empower them to, to know what's right for them, then the motivation is still there. You know, mental health is very important, like Sarania said before. So this is uh this is goes to all of us. So this is our our role as leaders. It's a great, great point, Maytel. I definitely like how you're you make the point about tying in you. Know, there's these business things and their KPIs and the goals and where we're going. But such a huge part of that is our teams and are the people that are working as a team to achieve those goals. Jax, what what are your thoughts on that? How are you kind of adjusting the the, the way you're approaching your team and what's different for your team these days and how are you supporting them? Yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm extremely passionate about this topic, um, and it was well before COVID. So when I came on, my micro is relatively small in Clorox terms, about 70, 70 people, give or take, throughout the country. So, you know, I, I moved us pretty quickly to everyone had laptops right away. Everyone was able to work remote. Um, I actually removed hours um, so that there is no start time, there is no end time. So I don't expect anyone to be logging on or coming to office at 8, 30, 9, 30, 10. I said, do whatever time makes sense for you and your family and your work. If you have a meeting at nine, then log at nine. But there's no re need, no reason I need you up at 8:30 just because 8:30 sounds good. Um, I, I firmly believe you treat people like adults to behave like adults. And if I'm worried about when someone's logging onto Slack or when they're coming into the office and when they're leaving, uh, I'm not worried about the right things, and I've probably not hired the right people. So um, you know, for me, I am actually very, very passionate about this idea that FaceTime is kind of BS. I've seen people come in at eight and leave at eight and do nothing. And I've seen people that don't come in the office for three weeks and produce like like maniacs. So for me, it's always been really important to ensure that people have the freedom, flexibility to take care of themselves, go off for a doctor's appointment without having to sneak out of the office or having to send a big message like, hey, guys, I have to go get a, a checkup at the doctor and I give all these personal details when really that's not needed. There should be a trust. And if we can't trust someone to get their work done, then we have to address it. And we've had those issues where people maybe aren't getting the job done and we have to address it. And sometimes you have to make hard decisions, but um, that's critical for this to work. But for me, we were already doing this. So there were times in the office we only had one or two people. And, and like a, one of our offices is 40 people and everyone's working remotely. Um, now this is different because there's no, you know, we don't know when we're gonna all be back together. So it's a little bit more unique, but between Slack and of course, email and video and, and being mobile on our devices, you know, I, I was really happy to see our team adjust this pretty easily. Um, and so coming out of this, it's gonna be nothing's changed and that it's all gonna be the same. You work in your hours and get stuff done and you communicate if you're gonna miss a meeting or if you can't be in a meeting and 
And that's, that's it. That's the crux of it. Um, it's kind of agile in the way we approach people management, you know, forget producing an output. It's just about how we work and how we treat each other as humans and respect each other. And we're all adults, you know, 21 or 81. Um, I shouldn't have to micromanage. I have kids at home. I don't need kids at work. Awesome. Great point, Jax. So, uh, uh, Saranya, y'all make products at Reich that help empower teams to do their project management work. How are you, though, internally, how are you supporting the folks that are working on your teams in, in these crazy times? Yep, good question. So I, um, we do a lot of things that, especially Maytel mentioned and, and Jackson mentioned. So I'm not gonna, not gonna, uh, for the sake of time, not gonna duplicate that, uh, you know, that that thought. Uh, but we do, you know, from a people side, taking care of people, right, is is important. So we do the, you know, very similar things. We have the virtual coffees, virtual lunches, virtual happy hours, and. Um, you know, we did like a St. Patrick's Day bingo game online. So we do a lot of you know, those type of activities just to make sure that, you know, we still keep that cultural element going. Now on the, um, so, you know, kind of talking about how we implement, right, how we kind of have enabled the team to uh, adapt to this type of COVID-induced uh, um, environment, right, COVID-induced uh, environment where we need to really be moving fast. Um, so we started this whole thing as a response to COVID, but when I look back at it, it, it has become a very, I mean, this is kind of a all, very close to a formal agile process, right? So what we do is um, we start with an idea and we create it, and, and there are four four kind of components to this, right? There's the owner, which is equal to the product owner in, in the traditional agile setting. And uh, typically in this case, it was me because it was an executive sponsored type of, uh, Initiative, but typically if it's a product launch, then it's the, it's the product marketing lead. If it's a you know demand and campaign, it's that person. Uh, then we have a scrum master, right? So the equivalent of a scrum master, which is the project manager, marketing project manager, an extremely important piece uh, of this uh, to to get this going and to keep this working. Um, if you don't have a project manager in in a, in a marketing team that's like you know larger than ten people, I would really recommend you get one person, you get get that role. Uh, so we we do have a project manager, very very important piece. Then we have a team, right? The team that's kind of implementing all of this. And the fourth piece really, which is the platform, right? So we do all of this in right. So we start that project. And then what we do is um, every, so we have these um, 8 a.m. Every day we have 8 a.m. executive meetings, right? Where we, um, where we kind of align on the strategy, um, you know, get our questions answered. Okay, so we're good for, for, for the day, right? So we take that and then 10 o'clock, we have the marketing scrum meeting uh, or, or what we call the marketing check-in. Right, it's a half an hour for the COVID response um, in type of campaigns, and I'm just using that as an example. Right, we we do all of them the same way. But uh, so 10 a.m., 30 minutes. It's very quick check-in. Hey, uh, we only look at what's in play right now. We don't think about what's coming in like you know three weeks, one month. What are the things that are in play right now? What is the status? How do we get that going? And you know, kind of talk about that. And then 3 3 p.m., I have my uh, check-in with the 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 project manager who plays the Scrum Master role. And then we talk about, we look at the what, what is traditionally known as a Scrum Backlog, right? So we look at that and we we make decisions on what's gonna get into play, right? So what what, what, what can we get into play? Um, so then we identify those, uh, more updates. And then uh, we also decided there needs to be brainstorming. So brainstorming is a key part of this. Uh, so we do very regular kind of brainstorming sessions, either like 10 minutes uh, on something. Hey, we need to do this, it's an idea, brainstorm. Okay, take that and then we operationalize that and put that into the sprint. Um, so we do it that way. So every day there is we kind of do this process, and that's how we 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 kept kept moving and and really launched things very quickly. Awesome, thanks, great. Uh, we are running right up against the end of the top of the hour. Um, Serenia, thanks for that for that great uh, explanation of how it's how it's running there at at, at right. Really good. Um, I want to see Jazz. What are your thoughts? Do you think we could finish up, or you want to pop this one question and run around real quick, or we got a couple minutes? Uh, you know what? I I think we can run over the time a little bit. Oh, I think great. that just answer a few questions and then we'll we'll wrap up in five minutes. 
Yeah, yeah, you bet. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to leave these sitting out there. So what we'll do is we'll just do <laughs> no a quick, problem at all. Yeah, a quick around the horn. Since I asked questions, I might as well address them. So we've got one uh, question here that I like the whole panel to weigh in on, just really quick around the horn. Uh, this is from the poll. This is this is from Ratish. It says uh, from the poll, we understand that online collaboration tool uh, would see a certain growth. However, does anyone here think that personalized digital marketing communications will be part of the new marketing strategy? strategies of brands. So let's do quick hits, uh, everybody. Jax, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it was already happening. I think personalization and, and marketing automation is, is kind of the future, even if you're in a pure play retail. So even more so now as e-commerce and omnichannel become more prevalent. So no question about it. So all the players there, and there's many of them from mobile app um, to email, CRM, ESP automation, to platform automation, to everything in between. Definitely get a big boost, and I imagine that'll just continue to scale uh, over the next couple of years. Awesome, Maytel. What are your thoughts? Hi, Jackson. Exactly. You know, it's already happening. It's just going to get better and better, and uh, and it's going to be very in a res. You know, personalization is not a new thing. So we're gonna we're seeing now a jump in innovation. So I think that there is some ways that we didn't think about it that is coming our way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. All right, Saranya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so you know, if you look at the data we have today, there's like close to a trillion audience data points that are available, right? And, and everybody's using those uh, to create hyper-personalized, like one-to-one -one personalized type of experiences. But I think what's now become more relevant is not just based on you know, who they are, but the current kind of market changes, right? With COVID, how do we make it more relevant and personalize it further, but personalize it very quickly, right? I think that's the change that's happening now. So yes, I do see that becoming more and more of a thing. All right, awesome. Okay, um, one quick question specifically going for uh, Jackson. This is from Jerry. Uh, it asks you, uh, what data points are taken into account to fuel your brand's decisions making process uh, in uh, making process into in determination in determining the direction, excuse me, I'm trying to read this from too far across the room. Uh, the the direction, the strategy and tone of messaging campaign during a time of crisis. And I think you probably speak to to either you know, Chipotle or T-Mobile, or maybe if you want to talk about Clorox a little bit now. Um, and is competitive data of of importance when you're doing that? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so competitive, yeah, qualitatively, like we'll, we'll try to get a handle on what, uh, so Chipotle is a good example. Well, that's no, not a good example because no one else is going through the same crisis. So, you know, currently on the D2C side, yeah, I pay attention to what other brands are doing, like Care of and Ritual and kind of see what they're saying. And, you know, I always give props to the brand too. I think they're doing it well. Um, we try never to be an us too. We try, never try to be a brand that's just doing everything that everyone else is doing in any company I work at. That's what I try to do. Uh, but I try not to also be overly worried about what the competition is doing. I want to set my own uh, uh, path forward and what our mission and our vision, our brand tone is. So, yeah, we use data points. I mean, social sentiment is obviously a big one customer care is a big one we have zendesk as a tool that helps us track all that um so that guides us um but to be quite honest we also try to keep a small group internally that is so close to the brand and and you know it's a combination of growth and brand creative and retention and and product uh, and, and folks that are just like you know they know the brand they live it um and we try to just battle test everything and we fight a lot on Slack and, and about ideas and, and discussions on what, what direction we should take, including this topic specifically uh, recently. So I wouldn't say it's as much quant data, it's definitely more qual. And I genuinely believe in times of crisis, we're talking about messaging and reaction, you got to trust your instinct. You got to have a bar for ethics. You got to have a foundational kind of moral pill. Like, what are we going to stand for? What are we not going to stand for? Forget revenue. I just don't think data can ever replace that. So if you don't have that, um, that's a different kind of discussion. But for me, it's the ethics line. Like, does this feel right? Does this feel good? And I know everything's been about data in the last few years. I'm, I'm one of those people who pushes that. But I think there are times like in a crisis where it has to be about heart and emotion and putting yourself with uh, in your customer's feet uh, and shoes and, and thinking with empathy. Um, so that to me is gut and instinct and experience more than anything else. Um, so that's kind of how I approach it. So probably not the answer. 
uh, he was looking yeah, for the bet. question. All right. Th thanks a lot, Jax. Great. There's always that balance between being quant and understanding where you stack up against your competitors, but also you got to be bold and be be the one that's out there in, in, in front too. So thanks a lot. All right. Um, Jazz, I think we have spilled over into everybody's uh, 11 o'clock call. So <laughs> I appreciate that extra time. I'll pass it on back over to you now to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks, Nick. And and it really has been a very insightful discussion as we navigate the challenges that come with COVID-19 and, and the global economy crash. We, we're all relying heavily on virtual events for business intelligence and breast best practice. So thank you so much to the panelists for joining us and Nick for moderating and also everyone for staying a little bit longer. Um, there was such fantastic advice to share. It really has been valuable. And, and on that note, uh, I, I am very excited to announce that we will be virtualizing Reuters Events Marketing Summit USA and hosting an in-person networking event at the end of the year if all goes well. We are finalizing details for the in-person component and preparing for a huge virtualization, but it should be announced in the next few weeks. So if you would like to keep in touch, be kept in the loop on who's attending, speaking and exhibiting, then you can pre-register for the info pack. Um, I'll send around a link right now and, and you can download the info pack or, or pre-register for the info pack there. My name is Jasmine Keys and I will be sending out the webinar recordings tomorrow morning. If you have any questions about the Marketing Summit USA or would like to see how you can get involved in, and meet these speakers, then please do reply to that email or ping me a message on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm always happy to hear from you. Um, so thank you, Nick, and, and thank you to our panelists once again. Um, and we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much. Bye.